the summer of 1836, when the Duke of Wellington was 67, Mr. Chad, once a member of the diplomatic service, called on his old friend at Apsley House. I have been reading, Duke, the fourth volume of your dispatches just published. Uh, it quite interested me to look them over again. <laughs> it recalled all the feelings of youth, especially the Indian dispatches. I felt young again, all the enterprise and excitement of that time. I had no idea of all the variety of knowledge necessary for a commander-in-chief. I wonder how you could suffice. Oh, I never should if I'd not been very young in command. We shall see how and why he sufficed. The Dublin, where the future Duke was born on the 1st of May, 1769, was stamped with the orderly splendour of the 18th century. He was born the Honourable Arthur Wesley, fourth son of the second Lord Mornington, professor and composer of music at Trinity College, Dublin. In later years, when they ragged Wellington about being Irish, he retorted, <laughs> If a man is born in a stable, that don't make him a horse! After two unfruitful years at Eton, young Arthur was taken by his mother, now widowed, to Brussels and finally sent to the French Academy at Angers. He was never without his violin. Practically all he had inherited from his father was love of music. What was to be done with Lady Mornington's younger son? My awkward son, Arthur. Hmm. Food for powder and nothing more. So they got him a commission in 1787, and three years later put him into the Irish Parliament as member for Trim. Then England declared war on revolutionary France, and the young member for Trim declared his political faith. It behoves us to lay before our gracious sovereign our determination to support and maintain the Constitution. I have no doubt of the loyalty of the Catholics of this country, and I trust that when the question will be brought forward respecting that description of men, we will lay aside all animosities and act with moderation and dignity. Meanwhile, he took his soldiering seriously. Well, since I've undertaken a profession, I'd better try to understand it. A new experience made him turn exclusively towards a military career. He fell in love with Lord Longford's sister, the Honourable Catherine Packenham. Vows were exchanged. But what are vows without a competence? Arthur must rise in his profession. So he went to the wars, first burning his fiddle. Philip Goodella, his biographer, says, perhaps an artist died then. He never cared to have it spoken of. Colonel Wesley's first experience of active service was in 1794, a ghastly retreat. The Duke of York evacuated his expeditionary force from the continent, Wesley covering his rear. The campaign has taught me what not to do, and that's always something. No one knew anything of the management of an army, though many of the regiments were excellent. A time was to come when even regiments that were not excellent would be made so by Wellington's management. But young Colonel Wesley was not destined to face again the onrush of the French flood in Europe. In 1896, he was sent to India. At 27, with family name changed to Wellesley, Captain Ellers remembered him as... All life and spirits, with a remarkably large aquiline nose, a clear blue eye, remarkably clean in his person. He spoke at this time remarkably quickly. In fact, quite a remarkable person. Those eight years in India were the decisive turning point in his life. Before, all had been tentative. Now he became a victorious general, governor of conquered territory, a diplomat, a dedicated administrator who was virtually his own chief of staff and staff rolled into one. Yet he never got lost in detail, but was always aware of the world context that made fighting the Sultan of Mysore seem an inescapable necessity. Suppose Frenchmen enlisted with the Indian princes. Well, they would shortly discipline their numerous armies in the mode which they've adopted in Europe, than which nothing could be more formidable. In the end, the country would not be worth keeping. Indeed, there had been that French-led, numerically superior Maratha force at Assay. He defeated them by the sixth sense he always developed on the battlefield. Years afterwards, little Mr. Chad asked the Duke during dinner at Stratfield Say, Pray, Duke. What is the best thing you ever did in the fighting line? Assay. He did not add a word. Waterloo was not won on the playing fields of Eton, but on the plains of India. India also taught him the habit of personal integrity. 
He wrote to a subordinate who had accepted bribes from a Raja for himself and General Wellesley. I am surprised that any man in the character of a British officer should not have given the Raja to understand that the offer would be considered as an insult. From India, he learnt the virtue of political honesty. I would sacrifice every frontier of India ten times over in order to preserve our credit for scrupulous good faith. What brought me through many difficulties in the war and the negotiations for peace? The British good faith and nothing else. Finally, India made him independent. Well, I'm not rich in comparison with other people, but very much so in comparison with my former situation. I got a great deal of prize money in the last war. So he came home and married Kitty. He'd not seen her for nearly ten years, and time, or fretting, had withered her. At first sight of her, he whispered to his brother Gerald, oh, She's grown very ugly, by Jove. It was not a happy marriage, though she bore him two sons. Wellesley remained in Ireland as Chief Secretary until 1808, with a brief break to take part in successful operations against Copenhagen. Suddenly, a corner of Europe, the Iberian Peninsula, challenged its French masters, and Wellesley urged support for England's ally, Portugal, recently invaded. The manner in which Bonaparte's armies are now spread in all parts of Europe affords an opportunity which ought not to be passed by. The opportunity was seized, and in June, Wellesley took command of a Portuguese expedition. He said, well, They may overwhelm me, but I don't think they'll outmaneuver me. First, because I'm not afraid of them. Secondly, because if what I hear of their system of maneuver is true, I think it a false one as against steady troops. I suspect all the continental armies were more than half beaten before the battle was begun. I at least will not be frightened beforehand. Wellesley twice defeated the French in Portugal during August. Then a ham-handed war office superseded him by two incompetent veterans. Victory was not pursued and the Convention of Sintra was signed, whereby the French army was allowed to evacuate Portugal intact. Wellesley and his superiors were hauled before a court of inquiry. Their grudging acquittal was quickly followed by Sir John Moore's death at Corunna. It seemed that the Peninsular expedition had reached an inglorious end. Wellesley refused to despair. I have always been of the opinion that Portugal might be defended whatever the result of the contest in Spain. My notion is that we ought to employ an army in Portugal amounting to about 20,000 British troops. Miraculously, His Majesty's government concurred, and in April 1809, General Wellesley sailed in command of England's last army on the continent of Europe. The battle honours he won in the peninsula are part of our heritage. 1809, Calavera, his first victory in Spain, created Viscount Wellington. But lest Marshal Sulte should cut him off from his Portuguese base, he retreated back into Portugal. For despite the bravery of his Spanish allies, he had found their commanders incompetent, especially General Cuesta. I can only say that the obstinacy of this old gentleman is throwing out of our hands the finest game that any army's ever had. 1810. Usako and the lines of Torres Vedras. Finest example of Wellington's defensive genius. Marshal Massena was ignominiously halted short of Lisbon and next spring fled into Spain. Despite Napoleon having sneered at Wellington as a mere sepoy general and ordered Messina to drive the English leopard into the sea. In 1811, Wellington's plans to capture the frontier fortresses guarding Spain misfired, and he fought only one great battle, Fuentes de Honoro. It was the most difficult one I was ever concerned in. We had very nearly three to one engaged against us. Moreover, our cavalry hadn't a gallop in them. <laughs> if Bone had been there, we should have been beaten. Even without Bernie, Wellington again had to withdraw into Portugal, his Spanish allies protesting bitterly. And were the British taxpayers to finance nothing but retreats? 1812. The frontier fortresses at last fell to Wellington after bloody assaults. The capture of Badajoz affords as strong an instance of the gallantry of our troops as has ever been displayed. But I anxiously hope that I shall never again be the instrument of putting them to such a test. Salamanca. In July, he defeated Marshal Marmont, swooping to victory the moment Marmont blundered. My God, they're extending their line. Order my horses. On the 12th of August, he entered Madrid. Private Wheeler of the 51st was there. The people were mad with joy. The air was rent with deafening shouts of B.B. Wellington, B.B. Les Angolisa, B.B. Les Ilandos. Wellington was at the head of the column. They called us their deliverers, their saviors. The poor Virgin Mary was forgotten, at least for that day. 
But the glory of 1812 ended for Wellington, as it did for Napoleon, in retreat. For both the most agonizing retreat of their careers. Wellington had been besieging Burgos when he heard that two French armies were converging on him. So his hungry, increasingly demoralized troops tramped through mud and icy rain yet again towards Portugal. 6,000 were lost on the road through sickness, straggling, looting, robbery with murder. This number would have been far greater but for Wellington's extreme firmness. The commander of the forces desires that notice may be given to the soldiers so that he's this day ordered two men to be hanged who were caught in the act of shooting pigs. The number of soldiers straggling from their regiments for no reason except to plunder is a disgrace to the army. During the Peninsular War, Wellington called his soldiers more than once. The worst army that has ever left England. He wrote to the war office... The government expects that people will become soldiers in the line and leave their families to starve, when if they become soldiers in the militia at home, their families are provided for. And what's the consequence? That none but the worst description of men enter the regular service. And in later years, he would sometimes say... Well, the French army is composed very differently from ours. The conscription calls out every class, no matter whether your son or my son, all must march. But ours are the very scum of the earth. Now, people talk of their enlisting for their fine military feeling, all stuff. Some enlist for having got bastard children, some for minor offences, many more for drink. He said that twice, but each time he added... It really is wonderful that we should have made them the fine fellows they are. Oh, let us hear what one of the scum had to say about the peer, as Wellington was often called by his men. We would rather see his long nose in the fight any day than reinforcement of 10,000 men. 1813. Wellington marched back into Spain. Victory at Vittoria. Not a mere peninsula, but a European event, for the Bonapartist court was tumbled pell-mell back into France. Wellington crossed the Bidassoa in October, his army being the first of Napoleon's foes to stand upon the soil of France. Their general felt they deserved it. The army was never in such heart, and it is probably the most complete machine for his number now existing in Europe. Our success depends upon the discipline of our troops, and there appears to be a new spirit among the officers, which I hope will continue. 1814. Toulouse entered. While the people cheered outside, an officer rushed into Wellington's room. I have extraordinary news for you, my lord. Aye, I thought so. I knew we should have peace. I've long expected it. No, no. Napoleon has abdicated. How? Abdicated? You don't say so, upon my honour. (laughs) <laughs> he returned home as Duke of Wellington and heard Mr. Speaker tender the thanks of Parliament. When the will of heaven shall have swept away the present generation, you will have left your great name to adorn, defend and perpetuate the existence of this country among the ruling nations of the earth. <laughs> Napoleon was in Elba, but someone had heard him say that he would return with the violets the following spring. Meanwhile, Paris in 1814 sparkled. As British ambassador, the Duke was lionised by all, from lovely Madame Recamier to formidable Madame de Stael. In January 1815, he went back to Vienna, where statesmen were busy easing the old regime back into place. Early in March, with the violets, came the news that Napoleon had escaped. From April to June, Wellington waited for him in Brussels. Suddenly, on the 15th, Napoleon pounced across the frontier, driving back Wellington's Prussian allies. That night, the Duchess of Richmond gave her splendid ball at Brussels. The Duke looked in on it. There was much whispering. Groups of officers left hurriedly. Presently, Wellington addressed the Duke of Richmond. Well, it's time for me to go to bed. Is there a good map in this house? In my room. Napoleon has humbugged me, by God. He's gained 24 hours march on me. What do you intend doing? Well, I've ordered the army to concentrate at Capture Bra, but we shan't stop him there. And if so, I must fight him here. Mont Saint Jean, Waterloo. Next day, the 16th, he was barely in time to check Marshal Ney at Quatre Bras, and on the 17th, he heard bad news of the Prussians at Ligny. 
He told his ADC, Colonel Gordon. Oh, Bluker's had a damn good hiding and gone back 18 miles. Well, as he's gone back, we must go back too. So he withdrew to the crossroads just south of Waterloo, placing all the troops himself. As he always said... I like to see what is on the other side of the hill. The terrain admirably suited the tactics he had brought to perfection in the peninsula. Secure lateral communications for moving up reserves and a reverse slope behind the long ridge of Mont Saint-Jean for protection and surprise. All night, the rain beat down, and Sergeant Wheeler wrote, The morning of the 18th June broke upon us, drenched, benumbed, and shaking with the cold. If I had not had a good stock of tobacco, I must have given up the ghost. Lord Uxbridge, Wellington's second in command, asked him about plans. Plans? I have no plans. I shall be guided by circumstances. But one plan at least had been made for old Blucher to support Wellington's left. Soon after half past eleven, the Battle of Waterloo opened with a frontal assault by May, followed by another, another, column after column, dashing headlong upon Wellington's ridge to break on his squares. As he wrote afterwards... Never did I see such a pounding match. Both were what boxers call gluttons. Mistakes were made and critical moments faced by both sides. But for Wellington, the issue was simple, to hold on until Blucher arrived. About one o'clock, Prussian forces were first sighted on the eastern horizon. In time, all Wellington staff were killed or wounded. Some of them, like Uxbridge, were riding at his side. My God! I've lost my leg! Have you? My God! The Duke galloped on. All was exposed. All was unscathed. About three, in an oven-hot melee, he was heard shouting encouragement to Captain Mercer and his gunners. Ah, oh, that's the way I like to see horse artillery move! Toward sunset, Napoleon launched his last battalions, the Imperial Guard. Ensign Leake said the awesome pas de charge sounded like this. Ram-dum, ram-dum, ram-a-dum, dum 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 Suddenly, Wellington's voice rang out. Up, guards! Ready! All of them, Maitland's guards and Coburn's 52nd, rose from behind the ridge in the high cold. Taken by surprise, the French broke and fled, while the Prussians, flooding onto the battlefield, helped to sweep the finest army on earth into limbo. The Duke rode back to Waterloo on his charger Copenhagen, and after 18 hours in the saddle, he slept. At three o'clock next morning, the army surgeon, Dr. Hume, entered Wellington's room. He sat up in bed and extended his hand, which I took and held in mine. Whilst I told him of Colonel Gordon's death and of such casualties as had come to my knowledge, I felt the tears dropping fast upon my hand and saw them chasing one another in furrows over his dusty cheeks. He brushed them away and said to me, Thank God I don't know what it is to lose a battle, but... Nothing can be more painful than to gain one with the loss of so many of one's friends. Then he drafted the famous Waterloo dispatch, rode with it into Brussels, and ran into his friend Mr. Creevy. The Duke said, Oh, it's been a damn nice thing, the nearest run thing you ever saw. By God, I don't think you would have done if I had not been there. Afterwards, he wrote to anxious friends, The finger of Providence was upon me, and I escaped unhurt. I never saw infantry behave so well. Wellington was appointed Commander-in-Chief of the Army of Occupation in France. He was largely instrumental in shortening its term. Thankfully, in 1818, he returned home, henceforth to be an integral part of the English scene. As a member of Lord Liverpool's Tory cabinet, post-war unrest seemed to him purely due to radical agitators. He wrote to his politically-minded friend, Mrs Arbuthnot. Well, it's clear to me that they won't be quiet till a large number of them bite the dust, as the French say, or till some of their leaders are hanged. In 1829, as Tory Prime Minister, and against the ultra-Tories of his own party, he carried the bill giving Catholics the right to stand for Parliament. How would he get it through the Lords, asked Macaulay of Lord Clarendon, who answered, Oh, that'll be simple enough. He'll say... My lords, attention, right about face, quick march, and the thing will be done. Wellington himself was accused of a volte face, although he had long contemplated some Catholic relief. Towards parliamentary reform, the Duke's attitude was unyielding. He found the pocket boroughs a reliable method of keeping power in the hands of the propertied classes. 
He declared in the Lords... The country already possesses a legislature which answers all the purposes of good legislation. I am not only not prepared to bring forward any measure, but I shall always feel it my duty to resist such measures when proposed by others. It was his swan song as Prime Minister. He resigned in 1830, and Mrs Arbuthnot lamented in her journal... I confess I am mortified beyond expression solely on the Duke's account. There is something about him that fascinates me to a degree that is silly, but which I cannot resist. He is so amiable, so kind-hearted, with a great appearance of roughness, and so frank, that I always feel I would die for him. And he would always die for his country. But just now, the country needed a gift Wellington lacked political imagination. During the reform riots, the Iron Duke was the mob's favourite target. I was hooted, as usual, on my way to the house. They smashed the windows of Apsley House, so he put up iron shutters. Taking one look at the reformed House of Commons, he said... My God, I've never seen such a collection of shocking bad hats. Whether the mob booed or cheered, he seemed totally indifferent. But he was human, as we see from a cheerful note from Mrs Arbuthnot in 1832. I met a man and his wife in a buggy close to Regent's Park. He trotted after me and said, I want to tell your grace that I pray to God to prosper your endeavours. I hope no offence. All along the road, the people turned out to see me. Gently and gradually, he changed from the controversial public figure into the beloved father figure of the country. He towered above party faction, writing during the Corn Law Crisis of 1846, I am the servant of the crown and people. I have been paid and rewarded, and I consider myself retained. For his valour, integrity and devotion to duty, he became recognised as the greatest Englishman of his time. His home, Apsley House, was known as Number One London. But it was at Walmer Castle that the great Duke died in 1852. His funeral, the last to be held in England with all the pomp of heraldry, took place in St Paul's Cathedral. England that day buried Duke of Wellington, Marquis of Duro, Prince of Waterloo, Duke of Ciudad Rodrigo, Marquis of... Lord High Constable of England, Warden of the Sink Ports, Lord Lieutenant of Hampshire, Chancellor of Oxford... That was almost too grand a farewell for one so modest in his habits, so simple and direct. More like him was his departure from the House of Lords after an all-night sitting. A group of workmen standing around happened to recognise him. God bless you, Duke! 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 For heaven's sake, people, let me get on my horse!